Hey everybody, and welcome to another love-filled edition of Pottywood. Hey, coming to you live, recorded yesterday on Valentine's Day. Uh, I am Steve Hester, actor and writer, and with me as always is... I 100% thought you were going for the George Takai from uh, Family Guy. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh my. Uh, I guess... I am Andrew Roger Carson, as I am every week. I have not changed my name yet. But, Don't you uh, ever change. I am, I am open to it. I am open to it. Right. Um, well, uh, as this was recorded on Valentine's Day, um, we've found out the results of the Super Bowl, but it is kind of overshadowed somewhat by uh, the passing of a true movie director icon in Ivan Reitman yesterday. Yeah, Ivan Reitman is director of movies such as Animal House. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time, Ghostbusters. Uh, Ghostbusters 2, Twins, Kindergarten Cop, Dave, and loads and loads of other films, as well as being producers on countless others. Um, you know, I, I think he's had so much of an influence over the last 40 odd years that it's, it's going to be it's going to be a tough one. Yeah. Um... Uh, it's in- incredibly bittersweet because obviously Ghostbusters being his his biggest hit mm-hmm. uh, of all time and, and his most cherished and loved film. And recently we just had Ghostbusters Afterlife uh, directed by his son. So it, it's this kind of like fitting passing. I mean, obviously, you know, he wasn't a young guy. He was in his what, 70s, 70s, 80s, yeah. along that line. 75, um, apparently. Yeah, 75. And uh, I, I noticed it this morning because I connected with Ivan Reitman on Facebook and I saw all of the tributes that were coming in and it was like, oh, no. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it, it's always sad. I've, I've grown up with an extensive knowledge of movies since I was a kid and I'd seen probably all of Ivan Reitman's stuff by the time I was 10 years old from Stripes, uh, you know, which is just uh, an amazing, uh, God, I wish I was a loofah. Uh, you know, to Ghostbusters, to everything else. Uh, and it is a, 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 a tragic loss, but when you look at the amount of stuff that he has left hmm. us with in the future generations, you know, it's it's a life well lived. Yeah, and a lot of his movies, they tend to have quite a warm feeling to them. Uh, you know, they, 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 they were never felt like they were going out there to shock or anything, and even even stuff like Animal House, you, you look at it and think, you know, there's a lot of heart behind that actual direction going on there, and it came through in a lot of his films. So yeah, uh, we are going to miss you, Ivan. Rest in peace. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and while we give out the love, we also have to give out the death, which is uh, tying in nicely to what's in the box from last week. Yes, Steve. Yes, it was the. Oh God. Oh. God. God, the Roger Corman Death Race 2000 from 1975. Yes, it was. What what a movie to pull from the box, Steve. Right. Did you watch this last night? I did watch this last night. Um, Usually I like to do a little bit of a build-up. But I'm going to be honest, I f***ing love this movie. I thought it was great. (laughs) (laughs) I did. It was brilliant. Now... (laughs) I, I, want to, I want to start off one thing, though. Roger Corman, uh, who, surprisingly, is still alive. You know, the guy was born in 1928, so he's he's about, what, he's six years away from his 100th birthday. Um, and he just was the king of making movies and shaving off and shaving off and shaving off the budget until just there was this core left and unlike a lot of the the schlock authors that you get coming out these days from like the uh, the asylum and all the rest of it it wasn't garbage it was always something that held together actually as a movie and this one was just oh mm, mwah, i i don't even i don't even know where to begin you know you look at the opening titles which look like they were the winning entries from a children's coloring competition uh, you've got you've got the, oh god the teeth the teeth in this film. It, it, it looks like the casting call was let's get some British teeth in. All these it it's like Paul Verhoeven before there was Paul Verhoeven. With this wonderful satirical take on a surprisingly empty America. 
yes. throughout your watching the film because I the, the basic premise is that there's this kind of totalitarian state and one of the things that they do every year is they have a race from New York to Los Angeles or in this case New Los Angeles and along the way these five drivers get to build up points by killing people with their car um and it's just glorious <laughs> and it's got some brilliant moments that i have to, oh, there is a there is a scene where they're explaining how the the point system works okay a toddler is worth this amount of points and you know uh, a woman is worth 10 points more than a man in all categories but an elderly person over 75 is worth 100 points each and there's this shot of nurses wheeling out these old folks onto the road <laughs> and what gets me about that whole scene is the fact that none of the old people look like they've got any idea of what the hell is going on. <laughs> they probably do. <laughs> There's no kind of, oh, we're outside, aren't we? There's nothing. They're just kind of sat there, just dead faced. I love the fact they brought one out on a stretcher. As I well. know. I was <laughs> wetting myself at that. It was, st- oh, God, this movie is just perfect. And you can tell that they were using Corman's philosophy of trimming things down where they they stop off in one section because the whole race takes place over three days they stop off at a hotel and they're all lying on this table and getting uh massages but they're very clearly in the lobby of a hotel somewhere yes. and then frankenstein who's the main character who's played by david carradine um his hotel room in one looks like it was in the the business center of the hotel and they just cleared the desks out the way and put a bed in and then later on he's in another hotel room and it looks like they've just filmed in an art gallery or something (laughs) and it's shockingly bad but at the same time you're there thinking okay this just adds such a wonderful charm and character to this film the only criticisms that I will give of it, because it it's it's so innocent compared to what could come out today. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of the scenes just feel like they're missing shots. Yes. Like, yeah. there's, there's a shot really early on where Sylvester Stallone, one of his early roles, and like I said, joke the other week, he keeps his clothes on in this one. Um, <laughs> he stands up out of his car. And the crowd's giving him grief because he's obviously the bad guy in the whole movie. And he fires a Tommy gun at the crowd. And you kind of think, was there a reverse shot where you saw him mowing down just like loads of people in the the stands? Because it kind of felt like there should have been. Yeah, but when you look at that, surely that would kind of go against the rules. That's just out and out murder. (laughs) That's not actually running them down with a car or anything. I know, but come on, if you're going to sanction something like the death race, you're not really going to be worried about a few people in a crowd being killed by one of them. Really, are you? I think just like he's a WWE wrestler and that's just like his gimmick. You know, with a name like Machine Gun Joe (laughs) V-Turbo. What has to be the greatest name of any movie character (laughs) in history. Brilliant. So, <laughs> oh, actually, one thing which did get me about everything to do with Sly is that uh, there is uh, there is a shot later on where he tries to because every car driver has got their navigator with them, and um, it's usually with a male driver, it's a female navigator, and vice versa. Um, but he goes and ends up attacking Frankenstein's navigator in a garage and Frankenstein shows up and the two of them have a fight and considering that this is the guy who wrote and starred in Rocky and was punched repeatedly in the face he's got a stunt double (laughs) and there's some shots he's a little distance away but you can clearly tell that isn't him is it Frank Stallone? (laughs) it could have been Frank Stallone for all I know yeah (laughs) Frank, Frank stop singing just come over here and take this punch oh god yes it's it's glorious. I've got. I, mean, I I saw this film probably in the eighties. Mm. I think it was a, a very trimmed down version of the movie, and I didn't actually see the full uncut version of it till many years later. And it's like, oh my god, it's just gross. I mean, to be honest, um, it's very short as well. Yeah, but that's that suits it perfectly. Mm. Like the scene with the manhole cover still makes me laugh to this day. <laughs> it is genius. <laughs> 
it is the greatest joke to be put in a, such a savage movie. I mean, the movie it was uh, directed by Paul Bartel, mm-hmm. uh, who's actually an actor uh, by trade. So you might know him from if you have a diverse um, movie range, you might know him from Eating Raoul or scenes from The Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. Or if you're more mainstream, you'll recognise him from Escape from L.A. or The Usual Suspects. Who was he in Escape from L.A.? Uh, He played, was it, oh God, I can't remember the character name, but he's in there. Okay. Um, But yeah, I mean, obviously you have David Carradine, who was fresh from Kung Fu at the time. Mm -hmm. I think he was just trying to get out of doing Kung Fu and that Chinese character that he was doing. You could probably tell because his hair was really short for this. Yeah. So he was probably so, in the process of growing back after shaving it for so long. Yeah, word is he just jumped into the first movie that came along to kind of escape Kung Fu, and this was it. And uh, he ended up netting 10% of the gross as well. which And this turned out to be quite a hit. Yeah. Strangely enough. So he pocketed quite a lot. So he, he made quite a bit of money, uh, more than Stallone did, for sure. And uh, the, the other things that I found out about this from doing a bit of research is... Uh, Roger Corman did a lot of the driving of the cars as the cars were not actually street legal. And just in case the police showed up, it would him that would take the fall for it. Well, listening to Roger Corman speak, that would just be easy to do. Hi there. I'm shooting a film. I think you can be able to let me off. He's got that... If you listen to him in interviews, he's got that... He has. It's like... Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a great documentary called Corman's World. And uh, it's all about Roger Com, and it's fantastic. Uh, apparently, the, the Frankenstein role was actually offered to Peter Fonda first, mm-hmm. and he flat out turned this down. He thought that the script was just too ridiculous for words, which is why it works. Yeah, you know, it is absolutely ridiculous. Um, also, in there, you've got Martin Cove of Cobra Kai. Yes, I noticed <laughs> that. Yeah. In a kind of like a blinking, you miss it because he's the first one out of the race, isn't he? Yeah, I can't even remember what the character's name was. But when I saw him, I was like, oh my God, that is Nero? Martin Cove. And they obviously, him and Stallone must have remained friends because yeah. they were together in Rambo 2, or First Blood Part 2, back when Rambo was credible. Um, You're still sore but, after the last blood, aren't you? Yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> that, I'm never going to get over that. But here's a bit of uh, a fact for you about Death Race 2000. Mm-hmm. It spawned a video game called Death Race, mm-hmm. right? Uh, way back in the day, whereas you would run over people and suddenly it just come up with like a big like gravestone, <laughs> like an X, or like a cross, where you run them over. The, that video game sparked the first ever outcry of video game violence. Yeah, and I'm going to follow that up. Uh, it didn't end there because in the late nineties you also had Carmageddon. Carmageddon. Carmageddon, yes. which and Twisted Metal, which were all yeah, you know, Carmageddon. I think was probably more based yeah. specifically on this. I think Twisted Metal was more kind of destruction derby, but Carmageddon had a very similar thing. You run over pedestrians, you get points, you've got cars, which are very very similar to a lot of the yes. cars that are in there, particularly Frankenstein's, because a lot of them have got like a, like a razor blade going in between the driver and the passenger side. Um, but that, yeah, again, that sparks off controversy as well. That was around about the time of GTA and Mortal Kombat and Doom, and that was all kicking off with the the video game nasties yes. of the 90s. So they ended up changing the pedestrians to zombies and having the blood green and because, yeah, we were cowards back then. But yeah, again, <laughs> like the film, these days it's so tame. I don't even think there's any swearing in this film. Not that I can remember. Nobody no. drops an F-bomb in this at all. <laughs> and all they the blood's like... that wonderful kind of pink sort of... Campbell's soup looking blood <laughs> that they used to have around about that time. And the greatest gag of a hand grenade. Oh, oh yes! Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely genius. It was like a Mel Brooks movie, wasn't it? <laughs> so so I guess this this sounds like it's the highest rated film you've watched on What's in the Box for you at the moment. Well, uh, I don't know about that because I th- we have had a few. It's which the most really enthusiastic enjoyed. you've ever had. <laughs> well, certainly for a while, because um, I mean things like we pulled out the visitor, which I really enjoyed. I thought that was a really good human drama, um, but this is so just insane and batshit crazy that there there is no way that you can watch this and not 
at least crack a grin. And what what did the uh, what did the girlfriend think of it? Oh, she loved it. Oh, the, then again, buttons it's, for violence. She's really hard to read because we watched uh, watched Wayne's World two when we were when we had uh, Ralph Brown on ages ago. It's like, oh no, this is this is this is the guest that we've got on this week. Oh, okay, so you watched it, blank face, nothing, not a single single thing going on. And by the end of it, she just turned to me and went, "Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was really funny." Ah, right. Like, can you not tell your face? <laughs> <laughs> Laugh for something, for God's sake. It's Pauline Kittle all over. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess you'd recommend Death Race 2000 then. I would. Um, it even makes me want to check out the, uh, the the remake, but then I did go on to IMDb, and that was directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, so... Well, I, I, it's a guilty pleasure, actually. I thought it was all right. I thought it was really good. Um mm. The one with Jason Statham in, and this does have a direct sequel called Death Race Twenty Fifty, uh, which you can check out, which is a direct follow-on. That uh, that was a later one, though, wasn't it? Yes, much later. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it is a Roger Corman movie, which is even better. Yes, you will watch our movie and you will enjoy it. <laughs> yes. Well, that's good to know that you've enjoyed that. I was I was dreading. What you were going to come back with? I thought you were going to hate it, to be honest. No, nah. but um, no, nah, uh, we, we've got you pegged down now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess it's time to get into some anniversaries. We watch them again all of the time, or oh, we get them on Prime for free. But we only know how old they are when we learn their anniversary. And here we are, mm. Valentine's Week. What kind of movies could be released in Valentine's Week all of those years ago? Well, we've got two for you. Is one Friday the 13th? No. No. But one of them is going to be a bit relevant, funnily enough. Okay. Uh, one I know you've seen, and the other I don't think you've even heard of. But uh, I'm going to go with this one. Our first one. Can you believe, Steve? Mm-hmm. 25 years ago this week... A movie called She's the One was released. Uh, have you heard of this? I have heard of this. Is that... Wait, because that's... Oh, God, I can't remember her name. I can see her face clearly in my head. But is this... Oh, no, I'm thinking of She's the Man. That was the one... Like, the, the body swap comedy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, this... Was this kind of like... Is she pretending to be a boy? No. No, I'm thinking of a completely... It, it, that's yes. a problem with all kinds of teenage rom-coms around about that. They all blend it was either one. going to go the realm of she's the one, she's all that, or she's the man, right? And yeah. you, you chose wrong. She's the one uh, was a... Uh, I guess we'd call it one of the Slice of Life couples movies. Right? And it was directed by Edward Burns. Uh, the actor, Edward Burns, who some of you will know from Saving Private Ryan... Or some of you may have even seen his movie Purple Violets, but this was part. This was the second part of what he classed as his Long Island trilogy. The first one was The Brothers McMullen, which was an indie darling in like 1995 mm-hmm. that won loads of awards and only cost like two hundred thousand dollars to make. And this was his follow one, which also was only a budget of three million, but he managed to pull in a very impressive ensemble cast for that money. So as well as himself, you had uh, John Mahoney from Frasier. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had uh, Maxine Barnes, who is a great actress who was more noticeable in this. And uh, she's not been in a lot since. But also you had Cameron Diaz, Leslie Mann, Amanda Peet, and, of course, Jennifer Aniston, who was fresh from Friends oh. at the time. Who was, you know, she was the most popular woman on the planet in 1996, and the most popular hair to go with it. Uh, and this was all about a, it's like a couple's dating movie. It involved around Edward Burns's character, who is in a relationship with Maxine Barnes, and his brother is dating Cameron Diaz. And obviously, something starts happening between Edward Burns and Cameron Diaz. Then you've got Jennifer Aniston's character, and you've got all of these others. And it is one of those almost kind of Woody Allen style ensemble pieces, and it's it's an okay movie. I mean, I've I've watched it again. Um, it, it has aged a little bit, but it has an amazing soundtrack that was done by Tom Petty, 
uh, of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Mm. So all of the songs in it are all Tom Petty songs. And if you like that music, which I do, uh, you'd really enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they basically plucked Jennifer Aniston straight from Friends. I think she came in and probably filmed her scenes on a weekend off from shooting Friends. And uh, the, th the thing that's so noticeable about this is when the Razzies come out every year. Now, on this year, the Razzies not only nominated Jennifer Aniston as the worst new star, but right. they shared it out with the entire Friends cast because this was the year when all of the Friends cast started making their forays into movies. So you had Courtney Cox going into Scream. You had Lisa Kudrow, who was doing uh, like Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion. David Schwimmer did a movie with Gwyneth Paltrow called The Paul Bearer. Matt LeBlanc obviously went and did Lost in Space. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, I think uh, Matthew Perry did, did lots of drugs. <laughs> I think he also did um, Fool's Rush In with Selma Hayek and then you had mm. Jennifer Aniston who did this so they were all branching out into to doing movies and the Razzies nominated all of them in a group could that be any more insulting? <laughs> they could and to be honest you know they weren't exactly great roles but you know they were starting out well they weren't exactly. really kind of starting out because a lot of them had done roles before because I know Courtney Cox was in uh, Ace Ventura before yeah. uh, Friends kicked off. Jennifer Aniston was in Leprechaun, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it wasn't as if a lot of these guys no, hadn't yeah, acted in stuff before. I think it was classed as the leadings, though. Yeah, I in suppose. the leading roles, um, because obviously they they must kind of put this out there, like, oh no, the Friends now you know are in their own movies. A lot of them were just terrible. I think they just had existing scripts out there throughout. Credit to Matt LeBlanc, though. He was like, oh, I'm going full blockbuster on this bitch. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in Lost in Space, which is like one of the biggest blockbusters of the year. It, being in one of the biggest blockbusters in the year for the year with the worst blockbusters ever. Because you had <laughs> Godzilla that year. You know, Lost in Space. The Avengers with Sean Connery and Ray Fiennes. And, oh, and God. It, it was the worst year for blockbuster movies that I can remember. You also had Batman and Robin. Oh, so, God. So it wasn't the best year. And it's funny when you look that year, how many people were kind of transferring out of TV into blockbusters around that time. So, so yeah, uh, unfortunately, that's the, the kind of memory that I have of She's the One, really. And it's not a bad film. It's got a great soundtrack to it. And if you like actors acting, you know, if, if you like seeing these situational like comedy dramas, you, you'll enjoy it. Okay. You know? Uh, but yes, that's, she's the one at 25. And uh, funnily enough, let, let's go back to something you mentioned a minute ago, Steve, but can you believe 30 years ago this week, mm -hmm. Wayne's World was released. Oh, no shit. No shit. Because <laughs> I, I genuinely have got no idea what movies Andy's going to pull out on the anniversary section until he actually pulls them out. Oh, God. Yes, it's scary to think that 30 years ago this week, this film was released oh, in the UK God. and hit number one. <laughs> oh, no. And uh, what an amazing film. It, it still is to this day. Oh, it's a know. great film. It just doesn't half make you feel old. Yeah, I still prefer this to the second one. Sorry, Ralph. But, mm. um, you know, this was when it was fresh. I mean, you, you consider the director, uh, Penelope Spheris. Mm. Uh, hi, Penelope, if you are listening. Uh, she directed an amazing documentary called The Decline of Western Civilization uh, and another movie called Suburbia. And then unfortunately after this, she got lumped with uh, The Little Rascals and the Beverly Hillbillies movie. Yeah. It, um, the Beverly Hillbillies movie was a guilty pleasure when I was younger. God knows what it holds up like today. Yeah, only because Erica Eleniak was in it, Steve. Yeah. You know, that was the only reason that you know that film exists to this day. You know, but um, the the thing that I always love about this movie, I mean, the, the humour still holds up, even though it's mm. it's aged a lot because basically this was a movie that came out during the last days of the hairband rock. Yeah, it was the decline of things like Iron Maiden yeah. and Motley Crue and things like Nirvana were coming in. and Yeah, the, the grunge thing was coming in. I think yeah. Airheads tried to retain it to kind of a less degree, you know, and the Beavis and Butthead generation and things like that. But when grunge came out, it just changed the whole landscape. The hair bands were dead. Mm. But 
during this year, you know, they were still there. This was the last highlight of that era of rock. And to prove it, I mean, this is still the most successful Saturday Night Live movie yes. ever made. Even more so than the Blues Brothers. Even more and so. That that's, was that fell into second. Huge. Yeah. Now, I think it works because, the yeah, there's lots of stuff, like you say, that references bands of the time. But a lot of those bands did try and make an effort to stay relevant. You know, uh, bands like Aerosmith, for example, they were still going through until fairly recently. Um, but I think what saves the film more than anything else is that a lot of the jokes don't necessarily rely on the knowledge of the music to be able to get them. Yeah. It's like there's that wonderful moment where Wayne and Garth kind of make up and he opens the door and Garth says, what's this? He says, oh, no, I just wanted to see a load of guys getting trained like in a James Bond movie. Yeah, it's like an Austin Powers movie. Yeah. So to speak. Hmm. Yeah. Um, there's so much to love about this film. I actually watched this again last night because I was like, you know what? I haven't seen it. I've seen the second one more times than I've seen the first one. So I'm going to yeah. watch the first one again. And uh, it's it's glorious. I mean, this yeah. is the movie that brought Queen back into prominence. Yeah. Right? Bohemian Rhapsody was huge on its second go around because of this movie and that headbanging scene in the car, which is one of the greatest moments in film in my eyes, for comedy especially. And it was it's, everywhere, it's... though, at the time, though. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Everyone was do- was doing parodies of that scene. Yeah, and I love there's so many little in-jokes that I didn't get at the time, but I've got much later on. Like, there's the scene where um, the the absolutely beautiful Tia Carrera, mm-hmm. <laughs> however you say her name, she's doing this music video where she's got this, like, snake around her, her neck, and she's in the Amazon, and she's kind of just wrestling this snake. And that was a, a clear reference to, was it Pearl Jam? I think it was Pearl Jam mm-hmm. that basically had... Uh, this music video experience where they were filming in this kind of Amazon type thing and they swore off doing music videos ever again because of the experience. And it was a direct reference to that. Right. Uh, which was which was really cool. But this, this was the movie where um, it's most infamous for the establishment of the Mike Myers ego. Yeah, because up until then, Dana Carvey was the biggest star out of the two of them, wasn't it? Yes, and... Word is, and I've had a chat with someone recently who did kind of bring this up, who was kind of involved on the picture. Uh, so I'm kind of quoting what they were saying. Uh, Mike Myers originally didn't want Dana Carvey or the Garth character involved at all uh, because the Wayne character was originally, he developed years before. And mm-hmm. when it came to Saturday Night Live, that's when they put the Garth character in there. And yes, Dana Carvey was the biggest star. Uh, but uh, apparently it kind of started there and he didn't want him involved. Uh, there was a infamous tale of yeah, <laughs> of uh, Mike Myers flipping over a table in catering during filming of the movie because they supplied butter instead of margarine. Right. Uh, the director actually uh, made her daughter... Uh, the uh, personal assistant to Mike Myers, and apparently the, the daughter did not have a good experience on it. <laughs> but uh, Mike Myers also argued over the final cut with the director, and uh, it led to him blocking Penelope Spheris from directing the sequel. Huh. Uh, he directly put the block on it. And, you know, this is where the initial kind of reports of Mike Myers' kind of behavior and and stuff like that. It, he is apparently incredibly hard to work with. And just ask if, anyone if... on TV AM. <laughs> oh God! Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and, and whether that comes down to you know specific needs that he has or whatever, but uh, as a person who likes to like really work with people, and I don't like working with people who are incredibly difficult. You know, you kind of hear some of these stories and you think, Jesus Christ! You know. It's, it's kind of hard to hear. And especially when you look at it, I mean, him and Dana Carvey in this movie are absolutely excellent, dude. You know, it's they are incredible uh, in these roles. And we absolutely love them. You know, they're like mm-hmm. the, uh, the Strange Brew for that generation. If you remember Strange Brew. Did you ever see that movie? No, I don't think I did. 
uh, Rick Moranis and uh, <laughs> sorry, the other guy, I can't remember his name. Um, they were like these these Canadian like uh, brewski guys, just addicted to beer. And they had this character on TV, and they got their own movie out of it called Strange Brew, which is actually really funny. Uh, so they were like that, but for rock instead of beer. And, and in this movie, they're amazing. And, and Tia Carrera is amazing in this movie as well. And uh, she, she carries a lot of the humor herself. Um, but the other standout of this is, once again, uh, the soundtrack is incredible. Oh, it's a fantastic soundtrack. Oh, From I mean, start I mean, to you've finish. Got, you've got Soundgarden. You've got mm-hmm. Pearl Jam, you've got Ugly Kid Joe, you've got Queen. You've, everything you could need from a fantastic era of rock music yeah. is in this. They just needed Winger in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but Bill and Ted's bogus journey ended up with them. And out of, out of one thing that we haven't mentioned is Rob Lowe, who <laughs> yes. just it, it, his, his character is so dry and the perfect kind of straight foil for these two guys and uh i think i think this was kind of like him trying to make a comeback at the time i think oh following his sex tape yeah Yeah. um (laughs) and yeah he did it with an absolute aplomb really did be by just being very very straight and uh and letting the other two just bounce off him i I love it yeah i love it you got a, a psychotic turn from al bundy yep and uh why did they come the... to me to die and uh one of the greatest cameos ever by robert patrick playing the t1 <laughs> <laughs> have, I got about have you seen this boy i love that i love that i remember seeing it for the first time and that happening and i think i i was laughing i had oh. to pause the film because i was laughing so much the only time that's ever been beaten in wayne's world was in the second wayne's world when charlton heston showed up um yeah. to play the uh can we get a better actor? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, absolutely genius. But yes, uh, Wayne's World. It is still fantastic. It is brilliant. It's one of the greatest comedies of all time. And I remember how huge it was. You know when it first came out. Brilliant. Uh, go and revisit it if you've not yeah. seen it. Go and watch it, and then watch Wayne's World too with our good friend Ralph Brown, upstaging yeah. everyone. Totally. Deservedly so. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that is uh, the only anniversaries I've pulled for this week because uh, we are so desperate to bring our guest out for some fun. But before we do, Andy has a quick word from our sponsor. You know, there are many different reasons why you would need a will, trusts and protection of your estate following your death. At the end of the day, uh, you want to pass it along to who you want without those unwanted clawing at your hard earned. In situations where you hate members of your family and you don't want them to have your stuff, or if you're with a partner long term and are unmarried, if that partner has children from a previous relationship, or if you just want to give specific gifts to people, you need a specific kind of lawyer. That being Morton Young Solicitors. If you want to safeguard your assets from divorce, bankruptcy, creditors, those bad addictive habits, you need a lawyer who really works with you and dedicates their career to helping individuals and getting the right results each time. You need a lawyer to be approachable, explain the layout and answer every phone call that you make. That is my solicitors. Contact Andrew Young at Morton Young Solicitors for a free first consultation. Morton Young, your personal professional for wills, trusts, powers of attorney, probates and administration of estates, as well as personal injury and litigation. My solicitors, call Andrew Young at 0161 464 9731 or email andrew.young at mortonyoung.co.uk today and quote Poddywood as your reference. Well, not long after our episode with Natasha Malthe, who is currently filming in Los Angeles on a movie right now, uh, she introduced me to a bunch of actors that she knew who actually enjoyed our podcast. See, they, they do exist, Steve. Thank God. <laughs> I know. Uh, one of these actors is our guest today. And as he likes to point out, he may actually be the first redneck on our show. <laughs> he may also be our first actor to start out advertising chapstick and toothpaste, which is why he's probably always seen smiling. So after I had my first talk with him, I realized this was going to be one of those episodes where the script's going out the window and we just talk and have fun. And that's why we're here. 
Our guest has been a working actor for over 25 years now. He's still belting out some great work, having only just finished a job recently. Uh, if you thought the Brian Krause reaction from the female masses was something, you should have seen the reaction to this guy's announcement from the ladies out there. So, joining us from Palm Springs on this fresh and somewhat breezy morning, we're joined by Rick Ravanello. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, guys. How are y'all? Oh, we're good. Thank you very much for joining us. So what's the weather like over there? Um, you don't want to know. If it's cold over there, it's not cold over here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, you know, I moved to the desert, and um, it, 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 it was a blessing. But, I mean, our summers are absolutely brutal. Um, our winters are just absolutely perfect. So it's golf country. You know I like to play golf. Well, yeah, not everyone well, can it, be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the back end of uh, some kind of storm. I've, I've lost track of which storm it is now. You know, so all the bins are laden all over the streets. Yeah, <laughs> we've got. Uh, it was actually pretty dark before. We've got a tiny bit of blue sky here. I've, I've suddenly turned into the weatherman. You have. You <laughs> have. have. Right. Well, let's let's crack on. Okay, so uh, looking at a uh, number of your roles, you tend to do lots of uh, army roles and uh, and military and, and kind of more authoritative figures. So, we, did you ever want to be a cop, or is that just something which happened on screen? I I, I actually did want to be a cop. Um, I I had a past, and and you know I won't get into you, but um, the only job I thought I was capable of doing was being a police officer. So. Um, that's how it all started. And, and I went through uh, Dallas PD and I went through Los Angeles PD. I was in both classes and waiting to get hired when I was I was in a shopping mall one day and a gal came up with a clipboard and she asked me if I wanted to audition for that chapstick commercial you mentioned. And I said <laughs> no. And my wife at the time, she was like, oh, you got to try it. You have, you have to try it. And so I, I said, OK, I'll do it. So they flew me to the Rocky Mountains in uh, Canada and uh, I, I did this chaps. It was like the, uh, the James Dean neon poster where he's, you know, yeah. he's walking in a back alley. And, and I came out and they're, they're, they're shoveling snow into this big fan and it's blowing me in the face. And, and I, I had to come out and put the lipstick on my lips and say chapstick protects. And that was the beginning of it all. Um, and it was, you know, at this point, I, I wasn't even thinking about acting. I wasn't thinking it was just a paycheck. And, um, I got a call from the ad agency a couple of weeks later and said, you know, do you want to, you want to do a Crest toothpaste commercial? And I said, sure. So I, I told them, I spit out the Copenhagen, I chew tobacco. I spit out the Copenhagen. And I said, yeah, let's do a Crest toothpaste commercial. And I got paid again. And yeah, it's a true story. And, and then I got called from an agent um, in Vancouver, Canada. And she wondered who I was, if I wanted to do this. And, and I said, sure, I'll give it a shot. And, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. I mean, I think it was, Probably a month after I signed with that first agent that I got on a TV show in, in Vancouver called Madison. And then it, it, wasn't, it wasn't more than a, a, a year. And uh, we got a call from Steven Spielberg's company. They were doing a little mini series over there called Band of Brothers. And uh, I, they flew me to Los Angeles. And, and I, I think it was like six times. And the... The last time I was sitting with Stephen and Tom Hanks, and Tony Toe was one of the producers, and uh, I think it was Meg Lieberman who was the casting director. We're all in the room together, and Damian Lewis. So we're we're both sitting in the room together, and uh, Stephen turned to me after all of our what they call um, screen tests, and he said, "Rick, we're going to use Damian for the Dick Winters role in Band of Brothers, but." Uh, we'd like to do another series with you called Semperfy, which was about the Marine Corps, which is some of my history. Um, and I said, okay, that's fine. That's cool. And they, they ended up signing me to a two-year development deal um, with DreamWorks Television. And that's where it all started. So from that point on, you know, they, they moved me to Los Angeles and uh, I was doing a lot of shows for them, but I was getting paid weekly you know, to be there to develop. I, I, listen, guys, I didn't know the first thing about acting. You brought up Natasha earlier. I think the only acting class I ever took was with Natasha. I was in Vancouver and I was trying to give this a go. And, and, um, and she was there. I don't think we ever really connected, which is another funny story. Um, but anyway, what happened, uh, 
you're in Los Angeles. You got Steven Spielberg who signed you to a, a development deal, and everybody wanted to know who you were. So I I was in every room, every casting session, everything that you know. They, if if Steven likes you, then he must be something. But I I didn't know what something was. I just did not know, you know, what I had and. And I was that guy that didn't know why they put tape on the floor <laughs> in front of the camera. You know, I, I'm serious. I, it, I just, I just did not know. And uh, I learned as I went along. I, I, I was also, and still to this very day, the actor that never goes back to his trailer. I'm, I, when, when they're shooting, you know, I, I get out there. I want to know what the director's doing. I want to see what other actors are doing. You know, I, I want to see what the crew is doing. I want to learn lenses. I want to learn cameras you know, all of that stuff. And, and I think that helped a lot. Funnily enough, that was the exact same thing that uh, Natasha was saying. You know, she's she's now obviously gone back to college and now she's getting more behind the camera. Is it? Yeah. Are you thinking of doing that in the future? I've had opportunities and I've, I've, I've I wouldn't say I've turned them down. I've, I've always kept it open. I was asked to shadow a couple of directors and maybe look at directing and, um, yeah, it's it's always a possibility, I guess. I I, I don't know, but I, I've worked with so many great directors. It's it's intimidating, you know, to even think that I could do that sort of thing. I love being in front of the camera. The confidence that I've developed over the years has come from a lot of great actors that I've worked with. Um, you know, telling me, well, Lou Gossett Jr. One one of the very first movies I ever did, Lou Gossett Jr. And I'm sure you know who he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and he took a liking to me. I took cookies to set one day and I was giving out cookies and stuff. And it was a military film. It was an action film and whatever. And, and I was... <laughs> yeah, Sorry, I'm, 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 <laughs> just picture you in full fatigues with like a box of... Like, <laughs> with a box of cookies. frosted cookies. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the truth. And, and Lou would laugh. He, he, just like you guys just did. He would laugh and he would tell a joke and then I would tell a joke. And then one uh, afternoon while filming, he asked me to come into his trailer. Now I'm thinking, okay, what, what's going on here? So we go and we sit down, and I asked them a question. I said, why do, you, why do you ask production to give you five white towels every day and so many bottles of water in your trailer? And, and he said, it's payback. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He, it, it was his way of the mistreatment he had as a young man in the industry, uh, with, with the industry, and, and now that he's doing so well, it was like, you know, they, they owe me and I'm going to take it back. And, and then he turned to me and he said, don't ever, give your, don't ever give your dignity away in this industry because they all want to take it. And I've never forgotten that. And I've, I've played my entire career with those words in my head. There's a TV show we have here in America called NCIS. Mm-hmm. And it, it was running at the time, I think it was the first season. And I walked into the room with my audition papers and um, I'm, you know, I grew up in the country. I'm one of those guys. I'll put my hand out. I want to shake your hand. You know, I, I want to give you a hug. I want to say thank you. And uh, I did that. And the director sat there, and I won't mention his name, but he sat there with his arms folded, and he never put his hand out. So I sat back down in my chair, and I thought a second, and it might have been three or four seconds. I picked up my papers, and I said, thank you very much, but um, I don't think I need to be here. And I walked out. Now, that was at Paramount Studios and, um, in Los Angeles. Back then, we, we didn't have cell phones as much. We had, we had pagers. And my manager had a code on the pager that, you know, call me, call me, call me. So, of course, I called her back. I said, what did you do in that room? You know, they're, they're, they're not happy with you. And they said, you'll never work in this industry again. And I said, I just don't want to work with that director, period. And, and you got to remember, like, I'm a young, know-nothing actor just starting out and um i think 11 years later 12 years later i get a i get a call i get an offer to come play on ncis and i'm I'm always the first guy there so i get to the table read we're going through the table i'm over i'm sitting in the room by myself and in comes mark Harmon, and then in comes you know a couple of the producers and they came over and shook my hand and uh they said we never forgot you we never forgot you he said, when you walked out of that room that day, we weren't upset. The director was upset. Um, but we've never hired him again. And we're so happy to have you on the show uh-huh. right now. So I thought, I thought that was a pretty cool moment. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks to, thanks, to, thanks to Lou Gossett Jr. I never gave my dignity away. So, you did want to be a cop. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I, I've, found, I've probably made more money playing a cop than, than a cop would make in yeah. a year. You know? That's funny how Obviously, it works out. Well, it mentioned, obviously, you, you've kind of covered um, a number of things that we wanted to touch on here. So we'll kind of rein it back a little bit because I think the first yeah. time the name Rick Ravenello kind of crossed my screen was in the Gregory Hoblet movie Hearts War, the World War yeah. II prison yeah. camp movie, mm-hmm. which yeah. had a, a really impressive cast at the time. So, I mean, this was, was this your first real big Hollywood role movie-wise? Yeah, that was my uh, first big paying Hollywood role. Um, you know, I, I didn't know any of the cast other than Bruce Willis at the time, but they're all friends of mine today. You know, we've kept those friendships over the years. Um, it was it was daunting. Greg Hoblet was interesting. I remember when I auditioned for that role, I think it was also in Santa Monica, and um, I, I was driving home and I, I thought I had such a horrible audition that I went to a barber shop and I had them shave all my hair off. I was like, just, I just need to start over. You know, sometimes you just need to start over. And I shaved all my hair off and I got a call back to go back. You know what that is. I mean, you know, go back yeah. and, and do the audition again, whatever. And um, I was like, oh, dang. I literally went to a wig shop. I was literally in a wig shop looking for a wig <laughs> because I'd shaved my hat, all of my hair off. And I thought, this is crazy. So, I ended up showing up with all my hair shaved off and Greg looked at me and he said, what did you do? And I said, I just needed a haircut. And, um, we didn't even do the callback audition and I got cast in that role and we went over there and I'm I'm not going to say, uh, I'm not going to say Greg and I got along during the filming. It was weird. You know, I played football, American football when I was a kid and I had a coach that would always, you know, he'd always grab me by the mask and shake my head and scream at me and holler at me and, you got to be better. You got to be better. And, and, uh, I didn't understand it then when I was that young and Greg was doing the same thing to me. So at the end of the film, me not really particularly liking working with Greg, but loving Bruce, you know, loving call and loving Terrence, Terrence and I got along extremely well. Um, he stopped me at the door when we finally wrapped my character and he said, I love you. You did a wonderful job, and I just want you to know I wanted to push you because I think you have the potential. And I, I was, oh, man, I was, I was literally bawling my eyes out. I'm in Berendorf Studios in the Czech Republic, and Greg Hoblet saying that to me. So that was quite an experience. One of the, the saddest things that I kind of always remember about Hearts War was um, in regards to Jonathan Brandis. I don't know if you yeah, managed to I hang know. out with him on set. Um, in case uh, you don't know Steve, Jonathan Brandis, I think he, he'd kind of had a bit of a stalled career. And I think yeah. uh, when Hearts War was coming out, you know, it was a real serious dramatic role that he had. And all of his scenes ended up getting removed in the final cut. And this kind of led to him taking his own life. Yeah, I, I've, got that, I've got that story. And I don't mean to cut you off, but I have to tell you, it's very, very sad because I saw Jonathan two days uh, we were at, I can't remember the studio, and we were both coming out together. So I saw him two days before that incident happened. Um, Jonathan was a child actor, a, a brilliant child actor who had a yeah, great career. Amazing. Yeah. And, the, and, and then I think what happens with a lot of the child actors, you know, it does stall. You know, they grow up and, and you know, they change in, in many different ways. And, and I, I, you know, I can't imagine the pressure that's on them. I started in my, my uh, late 20s. Um, but to be, you know, fond over and, you know, the fans and all that stuff for all those years. Um, and then all of a sudden it goes away. So when Jonathan showed up in the Czech Republic where we were filming, he gained a lot of weight. Um, he was doing a good job. I mean, I wasn't really paying attention, but he was doing, obviously, I mean, there was like 15 of us, like sub actors under Bruce and Colin, whatever. Um, and he, he seemed happy. He seemed in, in control he was doing his scenes and yeah he, i don't i don't know why they cut him out but I, i'll never forget we went to the to the opening premiere and uh he was sitting there next like close to us and and uh yeah all of his scenes were basically cut out of the film and i could see it in his face and it, it made me sad and you know i i mean you know I, he's been doing it so much longer than me at that point and uh 
I saw him. He's very, very close friends to another another actor that I became very close friends with on Hearts War, Scott Michael Campbell. Um, and I'll never forget that day that um, we found out that he was gone. And it just it, listen, I'm getting emotional because it makes me sad. You know, you, you think about the mental health of people and how how important it is to um, create community and stay in touch with folk and you know, see if they're all right and stuff like that. So yeah, very sad story. Yeah, it was. And it was such a great film. And a lot of people have always campaigned for a a longer cut of it because I know that the the movie, unfortunately, kind of was scheduled to be released right around the time of 9-11 as well. So I think it got pushed back. So it is one of those movies that kind of has a lot of tragedy around it. And it's a shame because it is a really great movie. It well, it's a it's a wonderful works. movie, and if you, if if you ever have the chance to read the book, so what they did when I when I got cast in the film, they sent me a package, and it had the book, and and I read the book, and the character that I played, Major Clary, um, was the, the prominent character in the entire story, not the character that Bruce played. You know, I was I was getting excited, and then I get the script, and I see what they had done. You know, they 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 needed that A list person to sell the film, and they brought Bruce in, and I'm glad they did. And they changed a lot of what my character was to do uh, into Bruce's character, which was fine with me, you know, because number one, I was making a little bit of money. Uh, number two, I'm in this film with all these great actors. Um, it, it, it didn't really matter to me at the time, but I don't think the film gave proper homage to the actual book. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's quite a story. It's an amazing story. It's an incredible story. And, and I'll tell you what, the sets, oh my goodness. So, you know, we was, I think it was an old airport and they had built, constructed about, I would say, I'm looking at the Hartsware poster in my garage right now. It's crazy. But they, they, they built like 500 um, barracks. So, you know, the, the, the sleeping areas, the mess halls and yeah. all that stuff. And, and they had one scene where they, they marched in the troops, that they, the prisoners of war. And they had the Russians and uh, other than the Brits, the Canadians and the Americans, they were on one side and then the, the new prisoners would come in and the Russians were on the other side and they had a gallows. I'll never forget this day. They had a gallows and they set it up in the stunt that they were doing and they would, they would hang these prisoners of war, the Russians, while these new prisoners of war were coming in. And I'll tell you what, man. That was that was like that was like an emotional. Be- you know, we got to learn history. I mean, it's so important to you know yeah. to know what was going on. And but you know, the, our camp was the Americans, the Canadians, and the Brits, and we were treated well. But on the other side, you had these decimated people that they didn't care about, and they were just props to uh, you know to to scare mm. the, the ones on the other side. Wow, what what a great question! What a great I, I love talking about this because I forget about it. You know, that that was a long time ago, dude. 2002, yeah. Yeah, I mean, was this where your kind of friendship with Cole Hauser kind of came to be? Was this around the time of Hearts War? It, it, it was. I, I think um, I was somewhat separated from the other cast because of the character I was playing. So when you talk about Jonathan and Scott Michael Campbell and all these other guys that were playing in a group together I was I, my character was more uh, in tune with Bruce's character so we were kind of uh, you know the matchup so that separated me somewhat but it, it didn't totally I mean we all got along quite well and and uh, hung out quite a bit but I didn't hang out with them as much as people would think so Colin yeah Cole and I connected there and then what happened um I get back to LA now the thing about um Hard swore. I didn't work for a year, one full year after filming that movie because I lost 35 pounds to play that character. If I had done that movie the way I looked when they cast me, I literally would have been the guy that's like stealing everybody's rations and going out back and doing chin ups and push ups <laughs> in the back of the barracks. So I, I went on, I went on uh, soup and that was it and lost 35 pounds to do that film. And, um, Cole and I, we did connect there. I wouldn't say we connected like extremely strongly. So a year later, I finally got an audition. And the funny thing about acting, when you're at the very bottom and you can't get a job, 
you stop overthinking things. You stop, you know, you stop almost caring about what you're doing. Yeah. And, and, and I got an audition with Tom Selleck for a movie called Monty Walsh. Now I'll come back to that later, but it was after that the career started up again. When I came back home, I gained so much weight. It was ridiculous because I couldn't stop eating. I was like, I'm, I was famished and I couldn't stop eating. Now I'm an American. I got McDonald's and Burger King and all this stuff around me. Um, so I had an audition for a movie called The Cave. Now, at that point, I, I had literally had two auditions that day. One was a screen test for the remake of Little House on the Prairie where my character was the Michael Landon character in Little House on the Prairie. So they were going to do a, a little darker version of what the actual book was about in that. I, I don't know if you guys ever watched Little House on the Prairie. When I it was, was a, very young. Yeah, 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 it, was yeah, yeah. It, was very, it was very safe programming, wasn't it? Extremely, extremely yeah. safe. And, 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 you know, that, that was at the time, that's what TV wanted and what the audience wanted. So I just come from that screen test and I went, again, it's Paramount, so I go into Paramount, and we had an Australian director, we had an Australian producer, and then we had uh, two American producers from Screen Gems, and um, I can't remember. But anyway, um, the Australian producer had said something funny, and I, I told him a joke. I, I, I have a lot of uh, off-color jokes that I can tell you guys when you all come and visit me. Um, <laughs> it, it, he told the joke, so I told the joke back. And they started laughing. And, they, and then they said, okay, that's fine. Thank you, Rick. I didn't even do the audition. I didn't even, I didn't read the scenes. I didn't, there was like, it was just like, oh my God, I just blew it. Like, that was a bad joke. You know, and so I'm, I'm walking off the lot and I get a call literally when I get in my truck. I drive a truck, by the way. I don't drive a, I don't drive a little car. I drive a truck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can believe that somehow. <laughs> yeah. So I'm literally on my way back home and I get the call and say, you've been cast. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, I, I didn't even audition. I said, you know, they've, they've cast you. They, they want you to be in this film. So then I find out um, that Cole's in it. Well, originally, Cole was supposed to play my character. And then they switched some things around. And so Cole played the character he did. So we did the movie called The Cave. And we filmed it in, uh, in Romania together. And then we, uh, dude, I've got stories about Cole that I probably shouldn't tell. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I love that man to death. He's such a wonderful person. He's got a wonderful wife. He's got children now. Um, but we, uh, we got in a few messes together. <laughs> well, he seems to have been brought up a number of times recently with the, with the uh, last few guests. Well, yeah. yeah. Last, last week's guest was the director on the movie that Cole is currently in called Mooty that he's currently filming. So George yeah. Gallo was talking about Cole last week. Uh, funnily enough, I've had. Uh, Cole's name was raised as a casting for the movie that we're looking to do. I think the universe is circling around Cole Hauser at the moment. It's it's you know what it, it makes me so happy because number one he's such a wonderful person, and maybe you don't see that in the characters that he plays. But then he got Yellowstone, which is a TV series we have over mm -hmm. here. And uh, what people don't know is that it, that role was between me and Cole. <laughs> it was it was. <laughs> It was either going to be me or it was going to be Cole Hauser. And Cole got it. And, you know, I always look and say to actors, is, you know, you get the jobs that you're meant to get. And if you're not meant to get it, somebody, and, you know, that's the way it works. Um, and, and I accept that. And I, I think a lot of actors do not accept that. They get upset and they get depressed. And, you know, I should have got the role. I should have got the role. But at the end of the day, the right person gets the role. So when you go through your casting... You know, some people are going to be upset that they didn't they didn't make it. They didn't make the cut. Um, but the right person got the role. So I'm very, very happy for him. I'm very proud of him. Uh, he, he plays that character in Yellowstone like nobody else could. You know, he's just a wonderful person. And uh, it, it doesn't bother me at the end of the day. Is your main love film or TV? Or is it just whatever comes your way? That's an, that's that's a question that has has been crossed to me many 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 times over the years, and I think in the beginning, you know, when you go back twenty five years ago, twenty years ago, um, everybody was talking. I want to be a film actor. I, I want to be a, a TV actor. But that changed. Maybe uh, ten, fifteen years ago, you know, that changed because television. 
the content was getting better and the pay was getting better. Mm. You know, so it, it, at the end of the day, like you have to be a business person. You can't just say, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but you can't just say, oh, I'm an artist. Because a lot of artists are starving. You know, they're, they're, they're not making a yeah. living. Unless they get hit by a truck and, you know, then all of a sudden their art's worth a lot more. But, you know, they're, they're not making a living. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of actors forget about the business side of what we do. And, you, you know, you have to make a living. You have to put bread on the table. And, and uh, you know, television became this outlet that look at the, um, the mediums that we have for television right now. I mean, it used oh, to be yeah. we'd have like three networks and that was it. And now we've got HBO, we've got Netflix, we've mm. got Roku, we've got, you know, all these major mediums to, to show shows and, um, you know, they're, they're making money. And so we can make money. I don't think yeah. we're making as much money as we used to. And I, I think that's people think, oh, you've been in so many TV shows and so many movies, you must be a multimillionaire. And it's, that's not the truth. It's not the truth. It's a it's a it's a blue collar, you know, working class with with a small percentage at the top that are making all that money. And and um, it's just the way it is. You, you know, you have to adapt. It's it's like it's like you and I had to adapt with technology over the years. It's it's crazy. It's like I still don't know how to use my freaking phone. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you were able to get it working for this interview, at least. I, me yeah. too. I'm glad you all can hear me. Well, here's a question that you may never have been asked, or at least you've never given an answer okay. to. Okay. So we, we want to know, where's the worst place you have ever had to film, just so you can be welcomed upon returning there? Mm. <laughs> I, uh, I, oh, my. I've been in a lot of crazy places. I've been in Pennsylvania in the middle of the winter, and it's been cold. I've been uh, down south where, you know, the humidity. I've been in North Carolina where the humidity, um, but... And no disrespect to the show, I, I did a show called Medina, and we shot it in Qatar in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East. And um, I think it was like the middle of the summer. So you're talking Oof. about, you know, 150, and we're on the desert, and we're, we're filming this stuff. And that was brutal. On a side note, um, I absolutely loved being there. You know, the people were amazing. The food was incredible. Um, the, the filming looked incredible. Um, but that, I'll tell you guys, that was absolutely brutal. Uh, filming the cave in Romania, we did a lot of scuba diving. And there were days they put us on what they call rebreathers. So it, instead of like a scuba tank, this is something that, you know, you breathe in. And, and, and when you breathe out, it scrubs, you know, the CO out of the, the oxygen and gives you more oxygen and stuff. And we would be underwater for, you know, up to like three hours underwater, like 10 feet of water. So, but we'd be in underwater for up to three hours. That was rough. I'll never forget. Like I, I'd get out of the pool and I'd have to pee. So I'd run it. Now you got to take, you got to take the rebreather off. You've got to take your gear off. You got to take your wetsuit off and you got to go pee. And nobody else is peeing. And I wonder like, oh, wait a minute. No. I, know, oh, no. I know what they're doing. I, I did. Lena, he- Lena Headey was on that, on that movie with me. <laughs> Cersei was pissing into the pool. Cersei was pissing on me, like constantly peeing on me. Dude, guys, I'm serious. I was so disgusted. I was like, I cannot get back in the pool. How much chlorine do you have? Throw another bucket in. You know, some somewhere James Cameron is listening to this podcast and saying, Three oh hours, gosh. you pussies. <laughs> you pussies. <laughs> We were pussies, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the abyss, you had to practically live down there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You, you guys are bringing back so many memories. It's hilarious. I love it. I absolutely love it. Every actor has got their own kind of way of preparing for a role. So how has your preparation changed when it comes to approaching a role over the years? That's a wonderful qu- That's a great question. Because in the beginning, you know, being afraid, nervous, you know, somewhat scared. Um, all you did was memorize. You would memorize a script. You would uh, you know, know your lines. You'd show up. You'd hit your mark, and you would do your thing. I, I oh, this this one got me. I, it was like a movie of the week that I was doing very very early in my career, and and I had questions for the director, and, and the director said, just hit your mark, say your effing lines, and go home. And it it's it struck me almost to the point where I wanted to leave. 
when I did the movie Monty Walsh, and I think that was in 2004, it was a Western with Tom Selleck and the Carradine, Keith Carradine and Bobby Carradine, Bill Devane. I mean, we had so many amazing actors on that film. And I, I was kind of, remember, I, I hadn't worked a year prior to doing that movie. And I was at that low point. And, and I thought, you know what? I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And I came up with this choice not to tell the director what I was going to do. I, was, I still knew my lines. I still knew what I had to do, you know, throughout the scene or whatever. But I wasn't going to tell them because a lot of times they'll nix, they'll take away what you tell them you want to do because it doesn't fit the script. But what I've seen with actors over the years, like the great actors that, you know, we've all watched, it's like, I wonder how many times they've ad-libbed. I wonder how many times they've just thrown something different out there that, that really follows a story but makes a difference in that particular moment. And uh, I did that on Monty Walsh. I, there was one scene where I went to the props, uh, the props man and I asked him to give me a, 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 a bucket with uh, soap water and a mop and we had to scrub our cook. If, I hope you see the movie one day because it's a wonderful movie. And and uh, and and I I went out and we you know we're going to bathe this guy and aggressively, and um, I I pulled the mop out and I started scrubbing him with the mop. Will Sanderson was the character uh, at the time, and and uh, there was another scene where we're eat where where the where the cook Will Sanderson's character, you know he gets back at us, so he puts something in the food that makes our stomachs rumble. Whatever. There's seven cowboys. There's three outhouses and we got to run across the field, you know, to get, and everybody's fighting to get to the first outhouse or whatever. And I decided to lay back and, 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 and not get there. I, I wanted to be last. And in the middle of the scene, I stopped cause I had this, my open eyes and I, I, I pulled my pants back and cause I pooped in my pants. That that's what I wanted them to see <laughs> that I pooped in my pants. Then I just turned around and I walked back to the, uh, to the mess hall because <laughs> I crapped my pants. Everybody was rolling on the floor. And that was the moment when I realized how important, um, you know, freedom, freedom in acting is like, like, you know, you can ad lib, you can add a line or whatever, but you know, you still have to stay within the script. It's very important that, you know, you as a writer, Andy and, 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 and Steve, I mean, you know, it's important that we stay in the script, but, I've had a lot of directors say, you know, can you improve this? Can you improve this? So I, I spend more time not memorizing lines now. I don't memorize lines. I, I memorize the story. So, you know, if you send me a script. I'm going to read that script 15, 20 times, and I'm not exaggerating. It, it takes like the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth time reading the script for you to actually understand the story that you as a director or as a producer or as a writer want to get across to the audience. At the end of the day, the audience is the most important thing that we have because without an audience, we, we don't have a job. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned Louis Gossett Jr. earlier, um, but was there, there was there anyone that really kind of took you under their wing when you were starting out? Well, uh, Lou did, for sure. I mm. mean, he, he, he truly did. I mean, I think it was the cookies that I brought to the set, but it was, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, he loves cookies, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, the advice that he gave me was, was spectacular. Um, there was a moment with Steven Spielberg, and we're in the room together, and he asked me, who do you aspire to be as an actor? And I paused a moment, and I thought, well, really, I don't aspire to be any actor. I mean, I love, at that point in time, it was like Sean Penn or uh, Kathy Bates. or I mean, those were the actors of, the, of, of that era that were, like, just doing incredible, incredible stuff. I said, I don't really aspire to be another actor. I said, if you, if you ask me who I aspire to be as a person, I'd tell you about my grandfather. And Stephen turned to me and he said, tell me about your grandfather. And I spoke for like 20 minutes. I talked about my grandfather. His advice to me was, that's the absolute right answer. Don't ever change who you are. There's something inside of you that nobody else on this planet has. You need to figure it out, nurture it, and bring it to us. So that was probably the best advice I've ever had as an actor, and I've, I've, I've kept it with me to this very day. Yeah, words of wisdom there. And I kind of want to touch a little bit on The Cave, actually, um, mm -hmm. because, I mean, this was a pretty big role for you. I mean, yeah. you're working with a great cast, or as I call it, Steve, the Deep Rising cast. 
which is basically, <laughs> let's cast one of every ethnicity in this movie to get some tax credits. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but, so you have like Piper Bravo, you have Morris Chestnut, Cole Hauser, who you mentioned, Lena Headley in her urine. Uh, we've also got Daniel Day King. Don't, 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 listen, don't ever, don't, listen, brother, listen, I have to tell you this story. Before, keep your thoughts, but I have to, don't ever call Lena, don't ever call Lena, Lena Headley. We're sitting in a pool. We're, we're, we're in scuba gear. And I, I turned around and asked her, is it Headley or Headley? And she freaked Heedy. out. Like she, she <clears throat> freaked out. It's Heady. I mean, she literally berated me in front of everybody. We're, we're in freaking dive suits in a pool. Everybody's peeing around me. And she berated me for, for, for even thinking that it was Heady. So be careful. She, she's your countrywoman. Come on. Yeah. I, I think the perfect response anyone can give us is, uh, oh come on, gosh. Lena, it's the 1970s, you can sue her. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing at this. I should not be laughing at this. But, but also you have uh, Daniel Day Kim, who's gone on to do really great work now. He's, he's featured prominently quite a lot well he he did and, and the crazy thing about daniel and I, listen I, I love him to death but we had issues daniel was cast in that film. i had an assistant in the film daniel did not so there was a, you know a certain percentage of the cast that got privileges and stuff like that and an assistant is basically a privilege but i never used an assistant it's like go get yourself a coffee i don't need a coffee you know that sort of thing mm -hmm. and then one day i get on set it was probably the only day of the entire time that we're filming where I actually needed Letty was that was her name to be there to get something. So, cause you know, we're in the pool and we're doing all this stuff, whatever. And Letty says, well, Daniel asked me to go get him a pair of shoes. So I'm going to get a pair of shoes. I'm like, what, whose assistant are you? Like what's going on? And so we had this little issue back and forth, but Daniel was complaining about this pilot he had done called lost that he didn't think it was ever going to make it. Oh. And, I, and I remember him telling me about the story. And I'm like, dude, that, that sounds like, that sounds incredible. Like, I, I can't wait to watch this show. So I don't think it's going to make it. Well, you know, the, the, you know, the story from there. I mean, Lost went on for how many seasons? And then he did Hawaii Five O, And, you know, he's had his issues. But uh, not a bad guy. You know, God bless him. I want to stick on the cave at the moment. Because, yeah, I mean, the cave, unfortunately was released the same year as The Descent, uh, yeah. which is another horror movie involving people being attacked by monsters in a cave. And I think that really overshadowed it here in the UK, especially. Mm, it did. Uh, that was uh, Neil, um, Neil Marshall, correct? Neil Marshall? Yes. Yeah, yeah Neil yeah. Marshall. And this, to this day, is Bruce Hunt's only directed movie. Oh, I love Bruce so much. He's such a wonderful man. You have no idea. I mean, I think the studio killed Bruce. Um, and, and I'll tell you, we, we filmed the cave prior to the descent. And then when the cave started finally putting out, um, their promo stuff and all that, um, the descent kind of, kind of piggybacked it. It was a lower budget, Neil Marshall. Um, they did a wonderful job. Um, but they piggyback and the smartest thing they did on the descent was release it first. So yeah. when they released that, everybody else had higher expectations for what the cave was going to do. Now, we shot the cave um, as a, uh, what, what, would they, what do they call it, like an R-rated, not a PG-13. Yeah. It was an R-rated. So there was, you know, there was cussing. I spent three days in, in, a, in a sound studio, you know, redoing my dialogue because I, I had the filthy mouth, you know, out of everybody. And um, they released it first, which was a, a brilliant, a brilliant you know, business move on, on, on behalf of the descent. And so when the cave came out, people were disappointed. Now the cave was like a $35 million budget film. You know, the, I think the descent was like 4 million. Am, yeah. I, am I correct? It was about $4 million. Um, but they did it. They did it freaking brilliantly. And, you know, props to them. That's, that's the way it all works. You know, uh, it was a movie with a predominantly female cast as well. So oh, yeah. it was, yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was something major, and I watched The Descent again uh, last year, and it still is an amazing horror yeah. movie for yeah, what they did is. with it. And it's just unfortunate that The Cave and The Descent falls into that ants, bug life, Dante's peak, uh, volcano yeah, yeah, mold of yeah, 
Yeah, I know. But 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 back to what I was saying earlier, we did film this as an R-rated horror movie. And when we got back home, they uh, they decided to PG-13 it. And so they made all these changes. There's one scene with the Australian director. He's now a uh, or Australian actor. He's now a director and quite prominent. Uh, Kiernan, Kiernan yeah. something Smith, whatever. Yeah. And uh, we get out on the dock and we're about to get on the boat and head off. And uh, his two children come running to him. Daddy, 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 don't go, don't go, don't go. And it was just a heartfelt moment that, that it, and they cut it out. They cut it out of the film. And, and I was like, you need those because he was. He, I think he's the first character in the film to actually get killed by the the, the creature. And uh, if the audience had seen that moment with him and his kids, I guarantee you, I was in the I was in the when we did the premiere, um, people were laughing at that moment when he got killed because it was kind of like just crazy, you know how it all happened. But if they had seen that scene with his kids, I guarantee you, everybody would have been crying. Yeah. I mean, in, in talking about Bruce Hunt, he didn't exactly do a bad job on the movie. I mean, he was a, a second unit director on movies like The Matrix yeah. movies, uh, yeah. Dark City, Alex Proyas' amazing movie. It, it's not in the same league of, like, Roger Christian, who only did his one movie of Battlefield Earth and then was suddenly just right. blacklisted. What I the hell happened why. with Bruce? Yeah, <laughs> well, we, we, we know why on Battlefield Earth, but... <laughs> yeah. So where we find out Rick's a Scientologist and we're in shit. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, shit. Okay, okay. Where's my UFO? Where's my UFO? <laughs> oh, my uh, goodness. Kip Lam. Yeah. Um, about Bruce, he, he's, he's such a wonderful man. He came from uh, commercial directing before Sony Studios hired him for, uh, for The Cave. And that was, an, that was a time when the whole shaky camera thing was popular. And, you know, I think it's too much. I can't watch any of that stuff anymore. But I became very, very good friends with Bruce until this very day. Um, the problem with that film was that the studio stood over him so strongly and, and so heavily. Um, it, it limited what he truly wanted to do every day. Now, look, guys, I don't care what I say, and I don't care what people think what I say. I'm just going to tell you the truth. You can't take a person's career away. You know, you hire them, you give them X amount of dollars to come out and do it, whatever. Um, but you can't take their career away and blame them for something that you, you knew in the beginning you were hiring them for. So it, it, to this very day, it makes me sad. We, we, Bruce and I still talk. I mean, he, he's such a wonderful man. I, I've gotten to know his children. They've, they're all taller than me now. <laughs> They're all big kids. I don't, I don't know what they feed them down there in Australia, but um, <laughs> just a wonderful guy, wonderful man. Okay, you spent a ton of time in Qatar. You have spent a ton of time in a cave. You've been in a prisoner of war camp. But what has been just like the most nuts project that you've ever been a part of? So I I got cast uh, in an episode of a series called Lions Den. And um, uh, I'm going to get emotional. Um, this role was me playing two separate characters. So one character was mentally handicapped and the other character was his brother um, who did not want to take care of him anymore. Um, my, uh, uh, my youngest brother, uh, who's passed away, was in a motorcycle accident and had brain damage. And he lived for 10 years and he was basically what, you know, the term vegetable, like, you know, you can't communicate, you know, you, 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 you're, you're, you're somewhat aware and whatever. And, and so I went to the audition um, and I haven't spent many times with my brother and seeing his condition. I played that character and they wanted me to play the opposite character, which was the normal, you know, healthy individual. And I refused and I walked out. And uh, I ended up getting the role. So I went in and I, I, I would have to do a scene with myself. So I, what would, they would do, they'd put a strip tape down the middle of the table and I'd be on one side and then they'd have uh, a, a double on the other side, you know, over the shoulder kind of thing, whatever. And uh, then I would switch around and I did that scene. And 
I stood up and I, I was, I wasn't emotional, but I walked back to the cameras and everybody was crying. And I thought, wow, I mean, they felt it so much. I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to do as, as actors, like just to, to change, like to, to affect people. Like I always yeah. say, it's like, if I'm doing my job, if I make you laugh, I make you angry or I make you cry. It's that simple. It's that freaking simple. Because again, I always think about the audience, you know. And uh, that that was a that was a, that was a, a very powerful moment for me. And it was also one of those times where I gave, you know. And that's another thing: being a performer. The more you give, the more you give, you get back. Mm. The more you give, the more you get back. It's very, very, very important. It's like too many actors today, and, and, and I hate to say it, but maybe some of the young ones, maybe not all of them, I'm sure not all of them, but they just, they want, they want, they want. You know, it's about the hair. It's about the look. It's about this. It's about that. Um, for me, I don't care how I look. I don't care about the hair. I don't care about all this stuff. I want to give you the best thing I can put in front of you so that you can give something else back. You know, pushing buttons, pulling strings, like it's so important for actors to, to realize that. And the young actors that are listening to this and may listen to this, you know, just give, just keep giving. The more you give, the more you're going to give back. It's very, very, very important. There was a, uh, there was a quote that I remember. It, it, it's quite a little bit, it may sound a little bit flippant, but uh, there was a quote that I remember um, Anna Faris talking about because when she started working with uh, mm -hmm. David Zucker when she was making mm -hmm. Scary Movie 3, he yes. basically said to her, there is no ego in comedy. And I think you're absolutely right. If you come into something with an ego, then that ego becomes larger than the project that you're working on. So you have to kind of absolutely. strip that back, get rid of that, and approach it almost almost as a blank canvas for yourself. Absolutely. You, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that because um, yeah. that you'll, you'll be a very successful director if you know you understand that. And and you know and it's going to start with your casting room. You know you're going to walk in there and you're going to see people and you're hopefully you understand who is who and you know, what they're willing to give and, you know, uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, just let the ego go. Let, let it go. Let's be yourself. Back to the whole Spielberg thing. Be yourself. Figure out who you are and nurture it. Be yourself because no one can ever tell you that you're doing it wrong. Right. Come on, guys. I mean, you know, we're on the same page here for crying out loud. It's like, I'm a redneck. You're a, you're a Brit. It's like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of in between. Yeah, you guys <laughs> might. I'll, I'll bet you're rednecks too, but you're probably herding goats and I'm herding horses. <laughs> That's exactly what I was doing with that goat. I was herding. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, don't say that. That's an image I don't need. <laughs> okay. So, Rick, I mean, all this passion for golf and not one golf movie on your resume. What is going on? I do have a golf TV show. I can't remember the. Uh, this is sad. That's why I wanted my IMDb up. I, I, I can't remember the name of the show, but I played a golfer, and it was at my home course that I was a member of, and uh, it went, uh, I guess, fairly well. I don't know. Um, <laughs> golf in my life is is been uh, a therapy. It's I have the most amazing friends that I play with. Um, I, you know, I I get out almost daily to be honest with you i mean come on you guys are british i mean you know golf you know the scots got golf i can't wait to come over there and play but um living in palm springs i think we have like 140 golf courses within a 15 mile radius um so and i'm, I'm a member of two different clubs uh, i play with the most incredible friend that i've met in the last seven years his name is grant fewer grant fewer won five stanley cups with wow. the Edmonton Oilers, uh, with Wayne Gretzky. Nice. And he's, he's become one nice. of my closest friends out here. So we play a lot. We, we, we gamble, we play for a lot of money. Um, and lately I've been sucking really, really bad. So I need to probably get a side <laughs> job. Uh, but I'm serious. It, 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 the people I get to play with is absolutely amazing. The charity events, or what really, 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 really got me into uh, playing golf. So whether it's for St. Jude's Children's Hospital or it's for whatever other cause that they have out there, um, that, that's really motivated me to 
get out and play more and try to be better. And, uh, you know, you're giving back to the community. You're giving back to people that just don't have the means to, uh, to make a difference in their own lives. And, and, and that, that's really special to me. I just absolutely love it. I think the best that me and Andy can do is we golf. <laughs> That's about oh, it, really. Well, well I'm actually, is, that, I'm actually, is that the video? Is that the video? Yeah. Hey, I, I I have actually stepped up from Wii Golf. I am on Tiger Woods 12 now. It's, it's only a game 10 years old. But the good news is, is when I do actually come out to Los Angeles in a couple of months, me and Bill Daly are actually going and playing golf in Los Angeles. So, Rick, you'll have to come along and join us. No, you have to come to my home in Palm Springs, California. It's 125 miles away from Los Angeles. I will treat you guys. You will be gems. You'll feel like a princess. I promise you. And, uh, and, and you'll have the best time, and you'll play with some amazing people. Um, I don't care how you play. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't uh, matter. I'm kind of worried about the people you do want to introduce me to if I'm going to be a princess while I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Back to farmyard animals again, aren't we? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I called you a princess. (laughs) (laughs) Not with our dinner and a movie, Rick. Come on. (laughs) Like we touched on earlier, you originally wanted to be a cop, but you've also done a lot of military roles. So, how have you been able to kind of move into those? It's an interesting story because in the very beginning, I have a background that. Uh, allowed me um, the opportunity to do military roles. So I knew armory, I knew weapons, I knew all that stuff. And so I was the easy cast. So remember, when I started, I was in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I did not sound like any Canadian at all. And uh, all the shows that they were filming up there were Canadian. No, they were American shows like one of the first series I did was the uh, pilot for Stargate with Richard Dean Anderson. Mm -hmm. And um, so it went from there and then it went to the next military role and the next military, you know, action roles, all that sort of stuff. Um, So what what happened, it was literally during the, uh, the Spielberg time with band of brothers and the whole deal that we did, I got cast in a role with Jennifer Beals. Mm-hmm. And Jennifer Beals, I, I don't know, what, what was the movie she did? I can't remember. Flashdance? I, I, yeah, Flashdance. So we're, we decided not to go to boot camp, and they, they decided, okay, you don't have to go to boot camp because we know what you can do. So I did this movie with Jennifer Beals, and I played my very first role of playing a real bad guy, like, like, like a, just a complete a-hole, like complete bad guy. And there's one, there's one scene in the film where I have to walk up to her and I have to grab her by the hair and I have to put a gun to her face. And so I do this and she gets, she stands up and she's so angry at me. It's like, don't pull my hair. I'm like, how am I going to do this scene if I don't pull your hair? It's like, well, I'll, I'll do, I'll do it for you. Like, you know, grab my hair and I'll pull into you, whatever. So we do it all. And the scene wasn't working. And we had a, a Greek director. She was wonderful. And she came up to me and she said, pull her hair. She, she literally said to me, pull her hair. So I, I, I did the next, the next take and I grabbed her by the hair and I pulled her hair and I, I did the scene. And then she gets up and she walks off set. She gets in her trailer and she locks the doors. She's not coming to set un, 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 until I'm gone, which wasn't going to happen because, you know, the, the scene worked and, you know, I, I've got to be there for X amount of time left whatever so that that was uh that was the beginning of the end of all the military well not truly i went to south africa and i did a film called outpost uh outpost 47 i I believe um so that was a military film as well and and that was fun i mean I, i love doing them you know i just got to the point like i do most of my stunts when i'm on set i uh i try to to a certain point, like maybe uh, 10 years ago, I was, might have been a little better at them, but you know, they've gotten harder and harder to do over the years. Um, I'm, especially the sex scenes, like, you know, those, those 20 second sex scenes are really difficult. So I need a stunt double. But, um, <laughs> Pills are available. Tw- 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah. 20 seconds. Yeah. I thought we were aiming for realism. 
<laughs> everybody's the extra 15 always, seconds <laughs> they always ask me, everybody always asks me it's like what kind of actor are you it's like i'm a c actor it's like what's a c actor it's like uh it's a small penis uh, pornography actor that does uh, seven movies a day in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm going to have so much fun editing this. I really am. Oh, yeah. Well, what attracts you to a project then? Because uh, you're always, I'm guessing that you kind of pulled out of the military roles because you kind of didn't want to be typecast down there. But what is it that, that makes you go, ah, yes, I really like this project? Yeah, typecasting is uh, it's a very dangerous route. I mean, you, know, you can get caught in it and, uh, you, you know, you got to find ways to pull out of it. But at the same time, you know, you're typecast for a reason and that reason gives you that job. So, you know, at the end of the day, you have to, you know, we talked earlier about business. Like, you, you know, you take that job. I did, I did, a, I did a TV series with uh, Steven Seagal. Oh, my God. I have to tell you this <laughs> true story. True justice. I have to. Yes, true justice. <laughs> true, so here's the best part was like, I got the call. Can you come up? So I was, I'm living in Los Angeles or at the time. Yeah, Los Angeles. I'm, in, I'm living in California. And I get the call. I was like, can you come up and do this role? And I, I, I read it and I was like, I, I'm not a big fan of Steven Seagal, but it's like, you know, a couple of days, guest star, whatever. I, I get off the plane. They put me in a, in, a, in a van. They take me to the studio and they take me to wardrobe. And I get into wardrobe and they're putting me in like eight or nine different outfits. And I'm like, what, what, this is like this is like two days. Like I should be in the same outfit. It's like, no, 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 no. You're supposed to be a part of the show for the entire season. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this. So I go up to the, <laughs> to the producer's room, Keanu walks in and he pulls out this binder and it's, it's full of like pages, like 10, 15, 20 pages. I don't know. And he's like, you need to study all this stuff about your character. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like I'm going home in three days. And, and he's like, no, you're not. Like, we decided to change your role to this character. And I was like, what? No, no, I'm not doing this. What are you talking about? And he's like, Rick, please just, you know, you know, stay with us and, and do, the, do the season. So we start doing the season. And I'm probably, I don't know, maybe three or four episodes in. And we have one scene where Steven Seagal actually has to sit in front of me. So I'm behind a desk. He's on the other side of the desk. And... He's got cue cards. He literally has cue cards <laughs> over my shoulder. Like, and, and I know what he's going to say because like, I, I studied the script. It's like, you know, it's whatever. So I know the script. And I look at the cue cards and I see what he's supposed to say. And I was like, okay. So he, we start the scene and he's, he crosses his arms and he says, gobble, gobble. And without hesitation, I, no, he says, uh, let's talk turkey. He says, let's talk turkey. And without hesitation, I say, gobble, gobble. The entire crew is laughing their butts off. Seagal gets up out of his seat. He walks off set and he won't come back until they take me off set. <laughs> Literally. They, it, but the crew doesn't want me to leave set. Like, they're just so... It wasn't the next day. It was like two days later. Um, <laughs> this is so fucking funny. I can't believe it. <laughs> two days later, he comes back on set and he's like five feet away from me with the producers. And he's like, can I shoot him in the face today? I want to shoot him in the face. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm going to get fired. Like, big deal. I said, whatever, I'll get to go home because I'm here longer than I want to be. And uh, they wouldn't shoot me in the face. So we had one weekend. We had a we, – guys, listen. So we had one weekend. Um, we had this car chase scene in a warehouse. So his car comes up. It goes over a ramp, busts in the warehouse. I'm shooting my gun out the side window. He's shooting his gun at me. All this stuff is going on, whatever. And we finish the scene and he leaves. And he had his trailer. It was like a fifth wheel. I don't know if you know what a fifth wheel is. It's like yeah. a, yeah. So he had a fifth wheel inside the warehouse and he had yellow tape around the fifth wheel, about three to four feet around it. So nobody could walk inside of that perimeter. And I'm like, it's the weekend? I walked into his trailer. I took the biggest dump in his toilet and I left it there. I, le I left it there the entire weekend. I don't think he came back until Tuesday, but when he walked in his trailer, he walks back out and he says, who took a shit in my trailer? 
You can't do that. It, dude, it became a legend. I have one, I've, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I have one more story. Go for it. Real quick. Um, I did a couple episodes on a TV show called Viper back in the day. It was I don't know if you all ever saw it over there. It was called Viper. It was like a rider. Yeah, it was like a car yeah. that kind of changed it, whatever. So I do this show and I do an episode with Mackenzie Phillips. Mackenzie Phillips, you know, um, from Michelle Phillips and the singers and that, that family group or whatever. So we do that and I get a call and it's like Mackenzie wanted me to play her love interest in this Saturday afternoon kids show called So Weird. So I get the script because back then they, they, they literally sent you a paper script. It wasn't on, it wasn't on, uh, you know, on, on, on your email. And, uh, I get the script and I'm reading, and I'm going, I got to play a mermaid. Well, a merman. And we're, what? It, it's, it's, a, it, Hey guys, it's, it's, it's October. It's October. And they want to film it in Vancouver and I have to be in the water. Now I'm, I'm thinking like, this is the beginning of my career and the end of my career because we've all heard of shrinkage, right? We've all heard of shrinkage. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting in, in a little apartment in Vancouver. I'm with my wife. And she said, well, you know, I, I, of course I tried the sock and then half a banana and all that stuff. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm putting it in there. So my wife says, let's, let's go down. I, I can't remember the street. Granville Street or something like that. So let's go down there. There's a lot of sex shops. So I walk in. I did not know that they sold flaccid penises. It's a rubber <laughs> penis that's not even hard. It's not even hard. It's like it's just like why would you even buy that? Like what would you do with that? So I bought it, and I bring it home, and I put it in my in my little trunks, and no, I, there, nobody's ever going to believe that. There's not a chance they're going to believe that. So I, I modified it. I, I cut it in half and I put a slice down the middle and I taped mm -hmm. it on and it looked normal. It looked like better than normal. So I get on set and when we get to the beach, the director says, on your count, take your robe off, go out in, in, into the ocean, which is probably like 50 degrees, and walk out like Bo Derek in 10. I'm like, okay. So I, I go in. On my count, I walk out. The water's coming down. It's below my belly button. All of a sudden, it comes below that, that point. Mm -hmm. And everybody on the beach is laughing their butts off. They're just laying on the sand laughing. I looked down where the rubber one had come off. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it, was over, it was over to the left. And the little one was on the right. <laughs> so, so I, 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 became known, I became known as Two Dick Rick. Two Dick Rick. <laughs> True story, dude. And it's on camera somewhere. One day it'll come out. I guarantee you. It'll be the day I win an Oscar. It's like, oh, look at this. Oh, yeah. Entertainment Tonight will just suddenly pull exactly. it out of nowhere. Won't exactly. They? So, so for the next time Rick appears at a Comic Con near you. <laughs> yeah, because well, we had John Ashford to be signed. the Madonna's, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> I asked to be signed by Two Dick Rick. <laughs> And I will sign it. I will sign it. <laughs> what with is up to you. So, <laughs> you guys are uh, amazing. Rick, from what I read, you're a Nova Scotia boy, correct? Yes. I was born um, in, on the island of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Which is an, it's an island at the north end of it all. Um, I, I, I then left at a very young age, and I went to Texas. And basically raised in Texas, so you know, shoveling horse shit, and doing that sort of stuff, whatever. So, has your career ever took you back up that way to shoot there? No, but uh, my manager uh, Scott Carlson, who was actually born and raised in Southern California, he's an Orange oh County my guy. God. <laughs> I yeah, didn't realize he, that he's, Scott was your manager as well. He's Natasha. Do you know Scott? Also. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, yeah. Yeah, he's well, the yeah, one who put I, me I, in touch I, with I, Natasha. Yeah, I wanted Natasha to be with Scott, so I mean. It's a crazy story because when we were in Qatar, Scott was the producer of the show we were doing. And um, when I do a job, all my money goes in escrow. Like it, it can't be, you know, trusting you to pay me every week, yeah. whatever, put, put my money in escrow. So we ran over and I was running over overtime and I was giving them, giving them extra time for overtime and all this stuff, whatever. And we got to about two weeks out of wrapping my character on the show. 
and my my agent called and they were like your your money hasn't come through so i was like okay it's like what, what do you want me to do he said well we want to fly you home we're going to buy a plane ticket my, my agent my agent is saying we're going to buy you a plane ticket we're going to fly you home and i was like oh, i don't want to do that i mean i love the show and everybody so i get called into scott's tent because we didn't have like 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 solid buildings they had tents in the middle east and uh i get called into his office and he's sitting there and he's got his feet up on the desk and it's like, oh, you, you know, what's going on? Like, you're not coming to work today? I said, no, I'm not coming to work today. You guys reneged on your contract. I'm not coming to work. He said, you, and he got angry, like really, really, really angry. Like, you have to come to work. I was like, no, you reneged on your contract. I'm not coming to work. My agent's going to fly me home. You can recast the character and whatever. The funniest thing is he calmed down and we had this conversation and we became literally close friends, like, at the at the end of it, I was like, you know what? I think you need to manage my career. I think this is where I need to go right now because I hate you so much. I love you. So, <laughs> you know, you need to manage my career. And we've been as close as you could imagine over the last, oh, my gosh, probably uh, five, six years together. He's been amazing. He moved. He's, he married a girl from a place called Prince Edward Island. Uh, in the eastern side of uh, Canada. And so he left California. He went out there. He's building a studio. So he's got his own studio being built. Um, he's got a number of projects that we'll do together uh, this year and into next year. Yeah, I, I'm so excited for him. You know, it turned out really, 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 really well. Yeah, what a guy. Well, I have a bit of trivia here. Uh, okay. Some people may not know. I didn't know this, is, actually. Ah, well, I'm glad you can see the question, Steve. <laughs> but what some people don't realize is before the day of Ryan Reynolds and Chris Evans, <laughs> there was another actor who had been in both a Marvel property as well as a DC property. He may actually have been one of the first. So Rick Ravenello here, you were in Smallville, was that correct? That's correct. And not only that... You were in Sergeant Nick Fury, Agent of Shield, yes. with the half. <laughs> the half. <laughs> that was an early one. Uh, he was fun. He was fun. Yeah, that eye patch made him look ugly, but you know he's a good singer in Germany. I think it works better on Samuel L. Jackson than eye patch. Though. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson has actually inherited a role from David Hasselhoff. That's uh, yes. That's something that he's got to live with. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I met Hasselhoff's manager years ago at a charity event. He was like, I want to manage you. I was like, not if you manage me like you're managing him. It's like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> There's going to be a video of uh, Rick eating a, a Burger King off the floor. <laughs> listen, guys, I, I, listen, I go so far they can't ban me anymore. It's like, it's like, just let him go. Just leave him alone. Let him go. It's, it's, you know, whatever. We've all eaten floor food at some point in our lives. Let's not <laughs> throw stones here. <laughs> yes. That's a step up for Salford. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to talk on Sergeant Nick Fury yeah. here because I remember seeing this film when it first came out, but I watched it again just last year uh, yeah. when it was on. I was like, oh, you know, what? I've actually got to watch this movie. And then suddenly I'm like, yeah, did I really need to watch this movie again? <laughs> but uh, just thinking about it, um, the other week, Steve, we mm -hmm. were talking about Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Yeah. And Sergeant Nick Fury actually starred Sandra Hess, who played Sonya Blade in Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> so, so, I don't uh, know if so, that's going up or going down. I'm really not too sure with that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what, Sandra Hess is the one actress I am dying to get on this show at some point. I, I will find her someday. Well, how do we do that? We, we, can, we can do that. We'll find her. Yeah, we, We'll find her because it's like, you know what? We've got the Mortal Kombat Annihilation watch-along episode coming up at some point this season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would love to have Sandra come and watch it with us and yeah. talk <laughs> and tell us the stories of what was going on in this movie, Sandra. 
Help us, help us understand. You, you know the the funny story is uh, the the Marvel and uh, DC comics yeah. and whatever. When when they first did um, X Men, uh, I had auditioned for the role of Cyclops, and of course, you know they liked me for the role, whatever. Well, that role yeah. became a screen test between me and James Marsden, and James Marsden ended up getting Cyclops in X-Men and you know, of course, wow. you know, you're disappointed because you're going to make a little, you know, a few dollars, whatever. Um, when I was in Romania doing the cave, there was a new movie coming out called the fantastic four and Michael Chiklis, who mm -hmm. was on the show called the shield at the time, uh, that he was, he was literally their first choice to play the character of the thing. And, they didn't know if he could get out of the show to do it. So they flew to Romania. They put me in a full body cast to fit me for the, uh, the costume of the character, the thing. People don't know that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't often tell those stories, but, you know, they, how close can you get? You know, like any actor, like just keep your head up and be proud and just do your work. It's like you're so close, like every time. And, yeah. uh, and what I said earlier, too, it's like, you know, just, just be you, you know, bring out the best in you. Whatever your history is, bring that out because, you know, that's what truly creates you and, and will make you the right choice for the right role down the road. Yeah. Well, the way I look at it is if you had have gotten the role of Cyclops, that means like 10 years later, you would have been doing Enchanted in spandex with two penises on show in a Disney movie. Yeah. <laughs> or even worse, you would have done X-Men 3. Ugh. Oh. Oh. Could you imagine a superhero named Two Dick Rick? <laughs> yes, they also call me the human clock. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Nine fifteen. Nine fifteen. Yeah, it's nine fifteen. Everybody, oh, <laughs> you know what time it is. Yeah. yeah. Why are you still looking at the small hand? <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys are amazing. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you may be one of the only actors to appear in two different Stargate properties, as well yeah. as uh, as well as well two different comic book properties, uh, two different CSI properties, as well as two separate NCIS properties, as yes. different characters every time. That's yes. a skill. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, we just wake up and, you know, you read the script and and you do your job and you know why they hire me i don't know all the time it's like i i've lived my entire career thinking that i would never get hired again literally thinking i would never get hired again and uh and and back to what we were talking about earlier it's like you know i, I don't want to use the term giving up but letting go mm -hmm. i think is the best term um and and just just do it you know just do it enter enter entertain like you know, I did I did a show called uh, The Closer where they, they had me play this like blatant leather dressed gay man. And uh, and, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. They kept, they kept calling me in for, to, to play gay man. And I'm, I'm like, well, why what, am I typecast as a gay man? It's like, what's going on? And uh, I finally played one with Kira Sedgwick and uh, her husband, Kevin Bacon, was on set one day and Kevin sat with me during lunch and he was like, are you really gay? I'm like, well, no, no, just no. I got a velour tracksuit on. It doesn't mean I'm gay. It's like, and we became friends, which was really, really, really funny. But it was one of the, the I, you know, maybe one day you all can see the, the episode, but it was a really fun and, and loving episode and uh, I enjoyed playing it. But yeah, it's just characters are characters. You know, what I'm doing now on the Pact is a different character. So, you know, they cut all my hair off and, you know, I got my gray beard and, and, uh, you know, when Natasha is in it and, you know, we're, we're playing our stuff and, you know, as, as a lead, you have to be the hub of everything. So you, you need all the other characters to, to kind of bring it up a little bit and bring a, a little more energy than what the lead will bring. Because I think as a lead, you literally are just the hub. You're the circle 
the center of the circle of whatever else is going on. And you have to somehow find a way to control it, which is very interesting to me because I truly love playing uh, character actors. Um, you know, I, I, I always, always believed and, and feel that they're the most exciting actors in anything that you may cast or, you know, any film might have. No, I can agree with you there. Um, and, and, uh, and also, I will just say there um, that uh, Rick has just answered the G.W. Bailey question that we had from the other week because G.W. Oh, yeah. Bailey was in The Closer. Yeah. Mm. One of recurring characters. Yeah. That, I didn't want to forget. Oh, that, that's, interesting. To... that's interesting. That's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, it was we... a wonderful show. It was a wonderful show. It ran for a long time. Because I, I only just saw a trailers for it on one of the TV channels over here. I can't remember which yeah. one it was. And I saw G.W. Bailey in it thinking... Okay, he, his shoulders have sagged a little bit because obviously time doesn't wait for anyone. But he doesn't look that much different than when he he's was st- doing Police Academy. He's still Captain Harris. Yeah, <laughs> dude, I swear to God, he's in like he's like in cryo whatever they do. They put him in a box and they just they 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 freeze him and then they bring him out and it's like okay, you got another role. So it's just like how long has that guy been around? Was he like one hundred and five? I don't know, but God, that's one guy I would love to have on the show. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, let's try to have him. Let's try to get him and get him on your show. Your show is amazing. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you for saying so. Oh no, we we, we love um, we love it when guests can just come on and feel so comfortable and just have some fun. You know, they don't necessarily need to promote anything. But I am going to ask you. I mean, what have you got coming out? What you've been working on? What's going to be well? Um, yeah, so I was just in Louisiana. I did a little movie with uh, one of your James Bonds named Pierce Brosnan. Um, awesome. And the funny thing is I did another movie with Halle Berry where uh, Daniel Craig was – I, I was so shocked that both of those characters were shorter than me. It just blew my mind. <laughs> it was like, how do you become James Bond and you're like five foot four? Like it makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> But so those, I don't know the dates. I can't give dates on those. But um, the Pact will come out on Roku in March. I think it's late March. Awesome. Um, we have I think we have like ten episodes the first season, um, and then we have to. That's that's with Natasha. I got another movie called Backward Forward, which I also did in Romania with Natasha. That should come out. Uh, I don't know. I think they'll do the festival thing with it whatever um and then Metana is going to come out in uh april um i i don't know i i truly do not know how each series will do i i i am so hopeful for them all because you know there's a lot of people behind these shows that are more important than me and and i start with the crew you know i i mean the the crews are are always amazing i i, I never really hang out with the actors i always hang out with the crew because you know, they're the ones every day getting up early and, you know, and leaving late and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, yeah, we got we got a few things coming out. So if if we're lucky enough, you guys will get to see them. All right. Well, oh, awesome. Definitely. We are definitely going to keep an eye out for that. And as always, you'll just keep us in the loop on anything that you do here that we can throw out and promote. But in the meantime, Rick, we want to yes. hear about your Nominate 5. Now's the time to nominate five. Nominate five? Yes, nominate five. Or three, or four, or six, or nine. Now's the time to nominate five. <laughs> you weren't expecting that, were you? No, I was not. <laughs> Sometimes we don't even tell them that music is coming up. There's been times where they've had their volume up so loud that we've nearly deafened them. I stood up and I started dancing. That was a good tune. Every single time I play that tune, I do air drums, particularly at the end. When we get our our older legendary actors and directors who are in their 70s, I say to Steve, Steve, maybe you should not include the music when we do this one. Because I'm pretty sure we nearly killed someone at one point. Yeah, John Ashton. We nearly. Was uh, it John Ashton? It was John Ashton, yeah. He loves coming back, John, but my God, we nearly killed him. But uh, anyway, what's Nominate 5, Steve? Okay, Nominate 5 is where we ask our guests to nominate five of a certain thing that 
tends to be something which is fairly close to them. Uh, it can be their favourite projects, their favourite artists, their favourite scenes, their favourite musical cues. It doesn't matter. This time around, we've decided that we are going to ask Rick to nominate his top five favourite celebrities that he has played golf with. Now, this is a countdown format that we try to get right every single week. And we, the average is pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Even when Steve did it the other week. And I just thought, okay, my first uh, one. Let's have a count hey, down we... from five, Steve. Jesus Christ. So, so, <clears throat> so we're going to oh start my God. five. Now I have to use my memory. That sucks. Uh, and, and if they cheat, we want to know. Uh... <laughs> Shame them, Rick. Number five, who have we got? N- number five, Grant Fuhr, Edmonton Oilers, five-time Stanley Cup mm-hmm. winner. Hall of Fame. Nice. Uh, number two, Jim McMahon, quarterback, Chicago Bears. Uh, craziest motherfucker I've ever met in my life. Uh, number three, uh, Gregory Hoblet, the director from Hearts War. Number four, oh, shoot. Number four. Gosh, oh, oh, Sterling Sharp, Pittsburgh wow. Steelers. Nice. Uh, number five, number five, Christy Swanson. Oh, <laughs> Buffy. That's Buffy the I Vampire was Slayer. No, she is one of the most incredible people I've known in my life. She's so amazing. I, I mean, yeah, you know, there's controversy and all that stuff, whatever, but Christy Swanson is a gem. Good golfer. Um, She's a good golfer. She's a great mother. Um, she's an incredible friend. I, I just adore her to death. Um, you guys would too if you ever had the opportunity to meet her. I hope she gets on your show. Well, yeah, we nice. we hope she gets on the show. I think that'd be an. Well, then we're going to make that happen. I'll get her on the show. So I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll lose the next round of golf, and I'll tell her if I lose, <laughs> <laughs> you have to go on the show. She'll be on your show. I guarantee it. She's a wonderful person. It's great stories. Uh, naturally, you know, uh, the first person I ever met in this business was Charlie Sheen, who kind of oh, opened me into Hollywood. And he's worked with her a lot in Hot Shots. And there's a movie they did called yeah. Chase. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so there's there's definitely a lot of great history we'd love to hear from her. Well, that is a great yeah. nominate five. Yeah. Uh, a bit different than usual. But, well, uh, if, I, if I had a six, I'd say Brian Krause. But when he, he gets angry on the golf course when he's not playing well. So, uh, <laughs> oh, Brian. Oh, we, had, we had him on just recently. Yeah, I know. Uh, did. What, what a guy that is. Oh, now, can you now imagine we... having both of, both of these guys on at the same time? <laughs> well, I know. We, we, we is... never got into stories about me and Brian, but there's a few stories. Uh, I, think, I think a double episode is coming up with you two. On it. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Yeah, can you get both of us on at the same time? That would be oh, a little nuts. I think I think we nuts. could work that. I think it'd be a free for all. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we want to say thank you very much, Rick, for coming on. This has been an absolute blast today. It um, really has. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed yourself more than anything. I know it's hard coming on to a podcast when you don't really know the two people, but uh, I think you've done really well, guys. You, you, you're both amazing. I, I, I can't thank you enough. I, you know, I said earlier, I, I'm, I'm not really big on these things, but it was just a pleasure and, and an honor. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. And, you know, I wish and pray for the best. And, and, uh, you know, your future filmmaking and your podcast and everything else. So, well, thank you well, very, thank much. you very much. And uh, no doubt we are definitely going to have you back again at some point because. Mm-hmm. Well, we say that to everyone, and sometimes people do actually come back. Well, I think we've got a, a whole list of people who are just like, when am I coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got more to say. I've been working. I've been doing stuff. <laughs> I have stories. <laughs> I'm, dude, I'm trying to retire. I don't want to work anymore. <laughs> just, just, just give me the money. Like, let me leave. Like, God. <laughs> let, me, let me live off my residuals. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Do but I have Steve. enough to buy golf balls? That's all I care yeah. about. Yeah, all the ones in the water. It's like I don't have a stick long enough to pick them out. It's like, yeah. what the hell? It's not what we've heard, too, Dick Rick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, you went there. I can't believe it. Uh, well, uh, I guess there's one more section to do, Steve. Yes, and one more question to ask. 
What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Yeah. What's in the box, Steve? Uh, What's in the box is the part of the show where Andy tries to improve my movie education by basically trying to get me off my Xbox and actually watching some quality cinema for once. So he's going to put his hand into a box full of movie titles that are all (laughs) certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. If I have seen it, then we keep pulling out names of movies until we find one that I haven't seen. And then I go away and watch that the night before we record our next episode. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, you can tell I've done that before, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just say this in your sleep now. But um, I went into the box and it was like, wow, this is uh, this is going to get an interesting response. Okay. Uh, the movie I pulled out, Steve, is Broke Back Mountain. Oh, Jesus. Don't lie, Steve, is it? you haven't seen it. I haven't not... seen it, but is it possible to have seen a movie in its entirety just through memes? No. <laughs> no. No. You have to actually go and watch this movie. Really? Can I not just edit the, the jokes that they've made about it on Family Guy all together and then try? No. And... No, okay. You have to watch this for our next episode featuring Frank Capello. You okay. need to come and talk about Brokeback Mountain and your first ever viewing of it. I wish I could enjoy you. <laughs> I wish I could quit the show. <laughs> right, uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. If you want to hear Steve's first viewing of Brokeback Mountain, then tune in next week, and uh, as well as anniversaries and every other section we've got, and our guest Frank Capello, who was the writer of the movie Constantine, as well as the director of movies like American mm-hmm. Yakuza. He was a quiet man, and his new film coming out, The Womb which uh, is pretty interesting. So for now, I guess we've kind of got to get out of here now. Yes. So big thank you once again to Rick. I have been Steve Hester. He has been Andrew Roger Carson, and we will see you next time. The, the best scene was the donut with the sperm on it. <laughs> what? Oh, I've got that to look forward to, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs>